Thank you, Michelle, and good morning to everyone. So the goal of this conference is for us to engage and participate and discuss and, can I stress, engage again. Um, so I look to all of you during the next hour and some odd minutes that will be in this opening session to set the tone for the rest of the conference, really engage with the speakers and ask questions and raise topics and, and, um, and be present. In recognition that you don't, you're not here for me, you're here for our four speakers that uh, will be taking their turn, I'm going to keep my remarks relatively brief. But it is an honor and privilege that I can be here today as part of the planning for LD4 and also to uh, introduce these speakers. Rather than a single keynote, we sought to bring in four perspectives um, to the stage today to understand different ideas of implementation in different spaces. And the speakers today really represent those perspectives. To start, we'll focus on a talk that looks at a community engaged around implementation of linked data by identifying the pathways to what that implementation will take. Um, particularly in this context in academic libraries, um, though not exclusively within that space. Next, we'll hear about the vision of engagement in an ecosystem around significantly broad community-based linked data projects. And third, we'll focus on opportunities afforded through metadata aggregation and linking of our data, particularly in shifting the cultural narrative that permeates many of our institutional collections. So with those remarks, please allow me to introduce all the speakers, and then they'll come up to the stage individually. Up first is Philip Skur, who is the Associate University Librarian for Technical and Access Services at Stanford University Libraries. In addition to the varied aspects of his portfolio, he is responsible for coordinating Stanford's linked data project development. The title of his talk is Linked Data for Production, Evolving Goals, Developing Dreams. Following Philip is Andrew Lee, who is digital media strategist and author of the Wikipedia Revolution, How a Bunch of Nobodies Created the World's Greatest Encyclopedia. He is also a noted expert in online collaboration and digital content innovation. He is currently working on the Metropolitan Museum of Art as their Wikimedia strategist and has a Knight Foundation grant with the Smithsonian Institution for working on artwork depiction and <coughs> metadata for Wikidata. The title of his talk will be Linking the world's knowledge through Wikidata, a vision for connected cultural heritage with the crowd. Following Andrew are, is a pair of co-presenters, Dorothy Berry and Amanda Rust. Dorothy Berry is the Digital Collections Program Manager for Houghton Library uh, at Harvard University. Her work has focused on increasing digital access to primary source documents relating to marginalized people's histories, and specifically on improving digital discovery of African American materials. Amanda Rust is currently the Associate Director for Services in the Digital Scholarship Group at Northeastern University Library. Her work focus on, focuses on the intersections of the social and technical as they affect just access to information, most recently via collaborations that help teach with or further develop the archives of underrepresented and marginalized communities. Their talk is entitled, Description and Inclusion, Surfacing Whose Histories. Up first is Philip Skirt. Please welcome. So uh, Jason made it sound like what I was going to say was really good. So uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, as I thought about uh, what to say today as well, he said I tried to keep it short, no more than 10 minutes. So no slides because I, I talk way too long. Than those slides. So um, it's an honor to see everybody here today. Uh, and it's a little bit nerve wracking to be the first uh, speaker. But one of the things I wanted to start out with uh, is a question. For you. So if I would ask any of you here to be able to give, give a clear distinction of between LD4L, LD4P, LD4L Labs, LD4P2, and LD4, so how many of you have a clear idea about the difference between all those? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the grand of the difference. So, uh, one of the things I wanted to be able to talk a little bit about today is um, not so much the difference between them all, but how we got through the pathway of all those grants to where we are today. 
So, and just as a little bit of a spoiler alert, the, uh, the whole theme is going to be one step back, two, two steps forward. So that is sort of the summary of what I'm going to say today. So the uh, origin of this really goes back to the first grant uh, in 2014, LD4L, or Link, uh, Link Data for Libraries. So uh, that was a grant uh, that was between three institutions, Cornell, Stanford, and Harvard. Um, and I just want to read a little bit about their, from their blurb about what the goal of that project was. Um, so the goal of the project was to create a scholarly resource semantic information store model that works both within individual institutions and through a coordinated extensible network of linked open data to capture the intellectual value that librarians and other domain experts and scholars add to information resources when they describe, annotate, organize, select, and use those resources together with the social value evident from patterns of usage. So that was pretty big uh, and fairly broad. Um, so I think though the real focus of that grant was how does the scholarly communi community benefit from linked data? So what are those use cases? Uh, if we are going to put all this effort into shifting to linked data, why is it that we're going to do it? Uh, in that first grant, uh, I have to admit, it was really organized. Well, there were fewer metadata people involved than there are now. Now there's a tremendous number. I think in that first grant, I was almost, I was close to the only metadata person um, on it, as far as I remember. But it was, what was really interesting to me as a metadata person is that a lot of the data we were working with was converted from our MARC data. So in a lot of what the questions they were trying to answer from linked data, it's like scholars, great linked data questions, linked data we're using converted from our MARC data. So, um, and it became very apparent to me in that process that the linked data that was um, generated from the conversion of that MARC data was really not very good linked data. So, um, and I think I always give this little spiel about why it is that I'm so much uh, in favor of shifting from the MARC <coughs> formats. So, although the FARC, MARC formats were great in their day, um, they were created in the 1960s, um, which was a great period in our history. A lot of wonderful things happened then. But just as a reminder, there's other things in the 1960s that we have given up, like electric, uh, like electric typewriters, like magnetic tape, uh, computers that were the size of this room. We've moved beyond all of that and still we use those MARC formats. And I think the biggest issue with the MARC formats uh, is that if you think about it, um, they were really useful at recreating that catalog card on the computer screen. So that is what they were designed to do. It still takes a human being like you looking at that screen to understand how those data elements fit together. And sometimes for things like books, it's fairly simple. For things like sound recordings, um, where there's absolutely no clue about which subject heading goes with which work, which uniform title goes with which, which work, um, performance, how long something took, where it was performed. So although we'd like scholars to be able to answer those questions based on our marked data, when we convert it, none of that data is there in the linked data. It's just there as sort of free text notes or things which aren't linked together. So then it was clear to me, and this is a step back, uh, if we're going to try to use our marked data as linked data, we need to actually take a step back and think about the creation of our marked data and create it natively in RDF instead so we can put in all those links so that scholars can actually get answers to those questions they were seeking. So um, that was the beginning of LD4P. So, um, and as you all probably know here, uh, trying to change those marked formats into something different is an extremely difficult process. Um, it's not just a single institution switching from one thing to another. Uh, the tooling was missing, the infrastructure was missing. Uh, we all worked in an ILS which is based on MARC formats. We contract with vendors to supply data which are in the MARC formats. Uh, we work with international partners and they all uh, they uh, contribute data to everybody else through the MARC formats. So it's not that you can simply say all of a sudden Stanford's going to start producing linked data instead of MARC. We're part of this huge community that needs to be able to change at the same time. So I think that is why one of the reasons why we are really sort of focused on engaging with you to be able to move that whole community forward because it's not something that anybody can do as an individual. Um, but then I think sort of getting to where we are today, um, 
so that was sort of where our um, evolving sort of goals changed from initially trying to answer those questions about what scholars wanted to do to well we really need to start at the root of the problem and start creating data in a different way. So but then once we started thinking about creating that data in a different way, that's when we started having these much uh, sort of greater expectations and dreams about what we might be able to do. I mean I think one of the things I've always been interested in as a cataloger uh, is to be able to use data in an international way. It still uh, doesn't make sense to me that at Stanford we need to recatalog um, all the German language publications, which are cataloged fully by the German National Library with authority records. Um, they are producing a linked data store of all of their data. Why should we simply be able to use that instead of recataloging everything in English in the United States? So the, the Technosium of France also has a great store of linked data. So I think by shifting towards this new model, uh, it's very much shifting towards an international level. We can reuse that data locally, which is something new. Um, we're also looking for things like uh, partnering with Wikidata. So uh, libraries have a very traditional way of approaching authorities and authority control, which simply does not, um, will not scale to the massive amounts of data that we need. So we need to find new uh, partners and new ways of handling things. This also gives us the opportunity to be able to explore what that might be. Um, and I think Wikidata is going to be a big part of what it, what it is we do about our future movie. And I think the other great thing is reaching out to other organizations like, uh, for instance, like museums. So there's another linked data grant that Stanford is uh, starting out with. It is a partnership uh, actually with the preservation community to use linked data to discuss uh, conservation documentation on um, uh, items in our collections. So that really is going to be more of a CDOC CRM model because it focused on something as an object as opposed to a bibliographic description of something. So again, um, they have different ways of looking at things, but it is linked data and we would love to be able to find a way of joining those communities together so we can use all that data in one discovery system. So again, that's sort of, uh, we're at the point now where we're really looking for sort of an internationalization of the project, reaching out to other communities and finding a way of drawing all the data So uh, to me, that is how we got to where we are today. And I think this is the first time we've ever reached out to such a broad group, uh, which is the whole point of LD4, sort of stepping beyond uh, just libraries to reach out to a much broader community and try to draw all the threads together. So I think that was no more than 10. <laughs> so, uh, that's my part for today, and I will pass it on to the next person. Up next, we have Andrew Lee. Good morning. Uh, just a quick show of hands, how many people here have heard of Wikidata before? Great. How many of you think or believe you are fairly knowledgeable about Wikidata. My hands go down. And how many of you think you're pretty knowledgeable, or fairly knowledgeable? Okay, good. So hopefully this will be useful to you because um, I'm not sure how many people have uh, heard about some of these things we're going to talk about with Wikidata and the type of projects we're talking about here. So when we try to describe what Wikidata is, um, we usually start with what Wikipedia describes itself as, as one of, the, one of the largest websites in the world, typically ranked in the top five in term, terms of popularity. Wikipedia often describes itself as the sum of all human knowledge. And it has done this better than anyone could have imagined when it started in 2001. But there's a problem, is that Wikidata is the sum, it is also, at the same time, the monolithic text-based language-dependent sum of human knowledge, right? And to use the semantic web parlance, we want things, not strings. Right? So how have we been doing that with Wikidata? We want to take things that you see in articles like that and have them as statements or modular pieces of knowledge instead of being stuck in a language-specific article. So the benefit of this is that we can reuse, remix, and reimagine human knowledge, not just because we have a license, but because we have the mechanism to do that when we have those things broken down into a semantic database. So today, the Wikimedia movement is much more than just Wikipedia. It is the multimedia repository of commons. It is Wikidata as a structured database. So we're trying to Think of these three things under the umbrella of Wikimedia as the most popular uh, projects underneath the Wikimedia umbrella. So you should know that there is another project that's trying to bring this even closer. There's a project called Structured Data on Commons, so that the Commons repository is not just opaque files there, but you actually have meaningful metadata attached to those things. 
and it is right now in the process of being launched. We have the, the capability of having captions in multiple languages and depiction statements, which are semantic uh, statements about what is depicted in an image or uh, a media file in comments. So that was launched in 2018 and 2019, and you should take a look at that if you can uh, to see what that status is. But in terms of Wikidata, it's useful to take a look at some of the stats around Wikidata. Right now, there's 56 million items and growing. There have been almost a billion edits since the project launched. And you'll see that the kind of the, the steep part of the S-curve really came in 2017. When this graph came out, you'll see that the number of statements that were added has increased quite a bit, but they are now being sourced in large numbers. So whereas Wikidata was kind of seen before as kind of unreferenced and having the majority of its statements not pointing to any kind of source, today the majority of those statements in Wikidata are sourced. Also, if you look at the activity of user edits per day on Wikidata, they've drastically increased in the last 18 months. So this is really illuminating here. We are going to show you a series of four maps of all the items in Wikidata with geo coordinates. And if you plot them in 2015, you'll see that probably to no one's surprise, the developed countries in Europe and North America have the most items that were added. But over time, this has gotten better and better. And you'll see that there's a little spot in Uganda there that got a big infusion of uploads. And if you keep going to 2017 and then eventually 2018, you'll see a lot more has lit up. So there's been a lot of progress in getting Wikidata more even in terms of its coverage of what is around the world. Um, for folks at this conference, I often like to say that Wikidata items, the pot of gold is at the end of the Wikidata item. This is where the identifiers and the pointers to other databases are. Oftentimes people don't see this if they're not involved with linked open data. Uh, so Wikidata identifiers point to external databases, and we found this really useful engaging new GLAM partners in Wikimedia projects, because we've often heard that a lot of librarians and museum folks say, we don't write articles, I'm not sure what Wikipedia does for us. But for metadata and linked open data, this has been a great, uh, a great collaboration. One of the more popular things on Wikidata is this mix and match catalog, so you can actually take your uh, database and align it with Wikidata and try to match what exists in Wikidata with what is in your database. This is a kind of game interface, and we actually have hundreds and thousands of volunteers um, going through these lists and saying confirm, remove, yes, no, maybe, and doing this click by click by click to match two different databases. There's another type of game that's out there as well where adding statements to Wikidata can be done um, through this kind of interface of, as well, in terms of saying yes, no, or maybe. This is a game that I developed with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where we actually used an AI engine to create possible depiction statements for paintings. And you can actually just play this on a mobile phone. I have my eight-year-olds play this, because it's pretty easy to say, is that a tree, is that a mountain, or not, to an eight-year-old. Harder to get them to write a scholarly type article in Wikipedia. <laughs> Uh, this is a tool called Protos. So once you have those depiction statements in Wikidata, you can all do all kinds of cool things by letting people browse art collections. So this is a project just looking at all the paintings and artworks and pictures and giving an interface to Wikidata uh, that is visual. So this is a project called Protos. Uh, and then we also have Wikisite as well, using Wikidata, or looking into using Wikidata. And this is an initiative to develop a database of open citations and linked bibliographic data to serve free knowledge. And a bunch of folks here at this conference were at previous wiki site conferences. And this is a tool called Scolia, which shows you, you know, what the scholarly citations look like in Wikidata. You can actually browse through institutions, authors, uh, different subject matter, and it tries to give you kind of a scholarly look, kind of like a Google uh, Scholar view of what is in Wikidata. So what are some of the challenges in working with Wikidata? Well, one of the big problems is that the import or federation of data with Wikidata can be tricky. Right? So the needs and practices differ across different institutions and fields of study. So if I were to say this is the most important thing that we're talking about here, um, it's that each of these different sectors of the GLAM space have different core missions. And this really does affect how they interact with Wikidata in the linked open data mission. Right? So if you talk about libraries, and this is just in general. Of course, you have libraries that serve as archives and museums that serve as libraries. But in general, if you're talking about libraries, you're talking about research and discovery as core missions. For archives, it's about preservation and access of, of unique materials. And for museums, it's about curation and interpretation. 
So they have very different needs, and they manifest themselves differently in terms of how we interact with them in the Wikidata community. Right? So whether they have original holdings that they need to catalog or how they work with them, you might have folks have higher activity in the area of original collections management. And then as a result, you also have almost like an inverted relationship with how much they play nice with intraoperable metadata. So one of the challenges in working with a lot of museums is that their first priority is making sure their metadata is useful to their curators under their roof. And interoperability is now starting to come into play for many museums, which has been a challenge. So this is kind of the, 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 the tough thing about working with different types of cultural institutions. So what are some solutions in doing this? Well, documenting and sharing practices better, and that's where we're really, if you look at those graphs, really only about 12 to 18 months into real deep engagement with LAM organizations. So we need better tools training, we need better code snippets. Um, Rob here is uh, going to be doing Wikidata training after this session today. And we actually have kind of a drafted workflow for how we work with a lot of GLAM institutions on how to bring their open access collections or metadata into the Wikidata and Wikimedia universe. So we have, you know, in the pre-upload stage, looking at things like licenses or how well your metadata matches what we have model in Wikidata or whether you should come up with new properties or models in Wikidata. The upload procedure itself, which is sometimes non-trivial, given that we have a mercurial community that sometimes doesn't like a thousand images per second being uploaded to our repositories. And then the post-upload, which is trying to um, find out how to correct, normalize the data, and maybe round trip that data back into your or own organization. So there's a lot of concerns along this path here. Another thing that we found is a big problem is bridging this chasm between data wranglers and people who can do spreadsheet manipulation and real folks who can do coding. And there's a real gap in that area when we find that's a big stopper for a lot of projects and that we don't have enough training in those areas. Right? So can we introduce more users and data utilities and tools? Um, so how might we support spreadsheet capable folks into folks who are more proficient in script writing? And I hesitate to use the word coding because that scares a lot of people off. Like, I'm not a coder, I'm not a programmer. You don't have to be, but if we can get more people into that realm, the better we are off. If you didn't know that we actually, in the Wikimedia universe, actually have an implementation of Jupyter Notebooks. How many people here have heard of Jupyter Notebooks before for Python? Great. Um, this is kind of confusing to a lot of folks saying, well, I don't know how to run Jupyter. Well, we actually have an instance running uh, on the Wikimedia servers. So that's kind of nice that anyone with an account can run those things. So we need more folks to experiment with these types of tools that we have. So you can try that today if you just have a simple login on the Wikimedia servers. So here's an example of some things that you can see on the Jupyter Notebook uh, platform that we have on the Wikimedia servers. I've done things with the Med and the Cleveland Museum of Art and other organizations um, so that these are all public for people to browse. Just skip down here. Um, so we need more folks who are adept at writing these blue scripts to connect the collections and uh, what we have in Wikidata. And we need to provide a training path and one thing that most people don't even know where to, what to do is where to start on this training path. And I wish more people would recommend learning regular expressions and filtering. This is something that not a lot of people uh, wind up doing. They kind of jump two feet into variables and programming in Python, where actually there's a lot of cool things you can do with just regular expressions and existing tools. Right? So I like to tell people, don't think Home Depot and you need to learn carpentry and hammering and nails. Think more IKEA. Like Think more modules and things that you can use off the shelf. Um, and then developing and supporting these Wikidata linked open data tools for the community here and for other folks who want to do this, that's been a real problem. We have one master developer in our community who, um, as a hobby, writes dozens and dozens of tools for us. We're really afraid that we could get hit by a bus any day now and our entire project will go down the tubes. So that's not a good scalable model and we need more than just the German chapter and these other folks who can do development out there. So that's also a challenge. So we need to identify and support critical tools for the Wikidata and the greater community, like folks here at LD4. And that's something that we um, can talk about in Birds of a Feather, or if you come to the Wikidata training sessions this afternoon, um, we're happy to talk about some of those. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, we have Dorothy Berry and Amanda Rust. Good morning, everyone. And everyone can hear me? We're good. And I have my notes.
notes on my phone, so I'm not checking Twitter while we're doing this. We're not looking at my notes. Um, so I'm Amanda. I work at Northeastern, and Dorothy is at Harvard. You'll mostly be hearing from Dorothy, but I'm just going to give a little bit of context um, to what she'll be talking about. So I'm here to um, talk about design for diversity, um, which is how I met Dorothy. And one of the wonderful things about a big project like Design for Diversity is that I get to meet a lot of great people. Um, and we were really glad that Dorothy wrote a case study for our toolkit to focus that focused on her work at Umbra African American Search. So this toolkit is part of a, this larger project that I've been talking about, Design for Diversity, which started in fall 2016, which I can't believe, um, with an IMLS Forums grant. I'm the co-PI with Julia Flanders, who's the director at our group in uh, the Northeastern University Libraries. So we are not archives or museum or special collections experts. We are creators of information systems. And what we want to do is prompt more inclusive information systems, both in our own work and in our tiny way in the field. Right? Whatever we can do to poke ourselves productively, productive poking, is how I think of it, um, and also others in the field. Um, and this is not new work, right? You can think of a lot of people in our various library archives and museum fields that are talking about inclusive information systems. We've been talking about Library of Congress subject headings for 30, 40 years now. We think about Sandy Berman um, and uh, Doris Haggard Clark, Clark, Clack. I always say Clark, the Hargit, I don't know that. Doris Hargit Clack, look her up, she's amazing. Um, so people have been thinking about <coughs> metadata and inclusivity for a very long time. So what we wanted to think about with Design for Diversity is how can we change our own practices, but why haven't our larger practices changed? Right? Again, these are not new topics. A lot of people are doing great work. So we focused on two main points of impact. So one was LIS and um, LAM education. What is happening in the cataloging classroom, for example? And so one of the things that we found was that while LIS archives and museum programs are starting to um, address issues of diversity and inclusion in the classroom, they weren't really happening in the tech services classes, right? They weren't happening in processing. It wasn't happening in cataloging. So we thought that's one potential target. With some, some programs are really outstanding um, counter examples, right? Like Knowledge River in Arizona is a great program, but most programs were not addressing diversity and inclusion in the core way. Um, and the other point of impact that we were thinking about was in the workplace. As we've done presentations on this, um, a lot of times, one of the questions that I hear from the audience is, this is all great, I totally agree with you, how do I make this happen at my workplace? And I say, wow, okay, let's think about workplace change then, right? <laughs> Even though we started out in this project thinking of it in a very technical way, which is a clear mistake. <laughs> um, so we developed this um, prototype teaching and learning toolkit. The URL is on the lower left, we're happy to have people look at it, um, give us feedback. And this was um, designed to be something that we hoped prompted both workplace and classroom change. So we first selected what we thought were some of the most impactful readings, and we tried to think broadly, right? Some readings from archival literature, but also digital humanities, sociology, critical technical practice, right? So we tried to bring some interdisciplinarity into it. Um, and then we commissioned two forms of writing for the case study itself, sorry, for the toolkit itself, uh, case studies and study paths. So case studies are specific analyses of information systems um, within using inclusivity as a major frame. <coughs> and study paths combine those case studies with readings and a learning activity. So it's something that could be used for study again, in a workplace or a classroom. Um, we really wanted to focus on case studies because we felt like it was a type of knowledge that wasn't actually typically captured in what we think of as the professional literature. Um, it's something where it would be the term my digital humanities colleagues use is uh, really focused focus on praxis, right? Theory-informed practice. So part of this came out of with our sort of loving frustration with our digital humanities colleagues who like to theorize about the archive an awful lot. Right? People have seen this. The archive is whatever it is. Um, and so our sort of response was, how do we actually find out what is happening when people are sitting down and processing? How do we have a more theory-inflected look at practice, but also a more practice-inflected version of theory? Um, and we were really interested in this case study from Dorothy, so I'm going to turn it over to her in a second, because I think what she has to say might be most interesting to y'all rather than me. 
um, is that she's looking at both digitization and metadata aggregation, right? So linking between, within collections as a way to surface items related to African American and black history. And that's one of the promises of ag aggregation, I think, that we hear a lot, right? That we can connect data in a more inclusive way and um, surface a more diverse set of voices. I was interested in coming to this conference because in my department, where we're thinking about this, a lot of our partners are dealing with the archives of underrepresented and marginalized groups. We always think of linked open data as like a magical wand, right? And we say, oh, we're having trouble with local customization, but it also needs to be globally interoperable. Linked open data, we will wave this wand over our systems, right? So we haven't implemented, I'm here to learn from you all, we haven't actually implemented a lot of processes around this yet, we just keep thinking of it as a magic bullet. And nothing is a magic bullet. And what I'm here to sort of ask you all and learn about is where are the infrastructural um, systems and applications that are showing the promise of linked open data? And I think there are some, right? But if I'm making a pitch to my metadata folks, we need to work with the community and a really detailed <coughs> local scheme that can then be globally interoperable. I'm looking for the system that's showing them why, right? And so I'm sort of looking for the um, implementation side from you all. So that's a little bit of background on um, the sort of whole sort of case study toolkit idea, but. So thank you, Amanda, for that generous introduction. And as the present, as I created a case study for Design for Diversity, my presentation is something of a presentation within a presentation. So it has its own introduction slide. So um, you know, my case study: digitizing and enhancing description across collections to make African American materials more discoverable on a research African American history, which is very snappy as a title, is a reflection of my time as working on a two-year clear-funded hidden collections grant at University of Minnesota, serving uh, under the title Metadata and Digitization Lead on a project designed to identify, provide enhanced description for, and digitize African American materials from across the archives and special collections. I'd like to state at the get-go that uh, while my title, I just my previous title, I'm currently Digital Collections Program Manager at Oakland, while my title included the word metadata, and while I wrote uh, descriptions and provided subject headings for over 8,000 records uh, on that project time period, I do not consider myself a metadata librarian, which is not to say that I think that's a thing one should aspire towards, but more that I haven't reached that aspiration at this point in my life. And I'm certainly not an expert on linked open data. I provide this caveat not to uh, devalue my opinions that I'm about to put forth to you, but rather to give you a better context for my subjectivity talking about these materials. So in light of sort of Amanda's earlier statement about community work and thinking about interoperability and local customization and how that can be pretty magical, um, I have this sort of fantasy quote that summarizes recurrent overheards at conferences around digital access and discovery that aggregation by design will surface marginalized histories and mass digitization provides the material bulk for those histories. Underrepresented community voices have possibilities for newfound control uh, and it is essential that groups enter their data on their own terms. The project I led and the aspect that I think has the most potential relevance to this group dealt with a different approach to highlighting African American stories. Instead of looking outward to community collaboratives this project looked inward at institutionally held materials and their legacy data in bibliographic records and in archival description. So I always like to say there is not a community I can go talk to about African American materials from the 1890s. I can talk to a contemporary group that can tell me their perceptions of their received past, but community gets thrown a lot around, gets thrown around a lot at this current moment to talk about including marginalized peoples which is amazing, but if you work at a place like Houghton Library, that means that what we're going to start in 1980 or something, and just all of these legacy records that have people of color in them and have queer people in them and people with differing abilities in them, 
are sort of assumed that those aren't our diverse materials and we're going to just push forward from here. So I'd like to present an exploration of how diving deep into collections both in the process of discovery and the process of aggregation, so that's going across a variety of institutions, uh, discovered a world of descriptive data that is perhaps enough for access under guidance in a reading room at those discrete institutions but nowhere near enough descriptive data to meet the goals of interconnectivity and increased discoverability that is foundational towards mass digitization and aggregation. So, this is talking about descriptive practices across time and platform. I will say that a lot of the uh, materials we're dealing with in this type of project are in archival collections, but a lot of them are manuscripts that were cataloged in a library context and so some things might seem very archive specific, but many of the examples I'm presenting today were often cataloged in the library context, and so there's both tiles of uh, descriptive metadata being created. So both the aggregator itself that I was working towards improving on research African American history and the mass digitization and rediscription project highlighted that what we are aggregating when we're aggregating descriptive data around African American materials does not tend to bring you a lot of African American materials. The descriptions that were enough for NPLP processing in an archive or for meeting someone's cataloging standards uh, quota, uh, no item level description, no folder level description, collection level subject headings, and name authorities that reflect the publisher and the author uh, become completely useless when they are digitizing and I'm looking at a folder that now has a title that doesn't represent anything that's inside of it, or a item that has collection level subject headings, but this item is a discrete photograph, and the collection level subject headings tell me about the photographer and the location that the, he took photographs, or more often the location that he lived. Uh, the quick fix in the course of mass digitization of creating refining aid entries or sort of dummy records, often using whatever title was written on a folder or the front page of a book, lead to both unnecessarily complicated discovery for users and often inaccurate perceptions reflecting poorly on the institution itself. I'm going to use the next two slides to explain what I mean when I say reflecting poorly on the institutions themselves with all of the institutions anonymized or speaking from work I did myself, so don't blame on me. Um, and not necessarily talking about the technical issues around export, but problemizing problematizing the assumption of the benefit of exporting our data that we have currently and connecting it with other data. So the example here um, shows two records from the same institution, although both of these records are also, both of these images as digital objects are held in multiple institutions. Um, and both of those records are titled The Nigger in the Woodpile. The phrase has roots in the times of the Underground Railroad, capturing the idea that something innocuous might be hiding something dangerous or harmful, i.e. that a woodpile might conceal an escaped enslaved person. The first image is a very popular political cartoon um, having Abraham Lincoln sitting on top of a very symmetrical woodpile that is hiding a escaped enslaved person, and then there's a lot of political talk about how Electing Lincoln, he seems fine, he's just some white guy from Illinois, but nigger in the wood pile. The second image is of young African Americans chopping wood outside of a barn. There is no descriptive, there's no um, real descriptive data on the second image. It's titled The Nigger in the Wood Pile, and there are two Library of Congress subject headings African Americans and Racism. These images are linked online through aggregation and through their shared uh, subject heading of African Americans. But the point I'm raising, which I'm sure people are already thinking of, is who does linking these two materials benefit? Other than people who already have a knowledge of Lincoln-era political cartooning. The enhanced discoverability of these two images, which are now gathered together, is fairly useless. And discovering these photos for most people, especially the photo for most people, and this is a professional photo of models. This is not a, like a field photo. Uh, raises the question to a user who doesn't have that previous context of why is the institution choosing to call a picture of people working outside nigger in the woodpile. And we know why, because it's written in very, very tiny font at the bottom of this. This is a production image that later became a postcard that was still just the picture of people working outside. 
but the assumption is at that time that this is hilarious. But to a contemporary user, which is a complaint I hear a lot from users, is why did this institution choose to pick this name? They're putting a lot, they're putting a lot more uh, intent behind action than especially minimal processing allows us to have. So this second example, which I have again blocked out the actual, uh, blocked out the main reference to the uh, institution, but I would say that the problems I'm saying for this particular material are replicated at at least, there were 54 results for the same music with the same subject headings, so this is not a discrete university issue. Um, so this example gets into the area of subject matter expertise and of the data creator, which is one of those things that we love to use for linking, although you know everyone's been complaining about lever Congress subject headings for a very long amount of time. Um, even ones that seem like they might be applicable that don't have an intrinsic offense to them still can lead to sort of offensive issues. As many people know, there have been multiple mass digitization projects around historic sheet music. It has visual appeal. People might be able to perform it. It's usually in the public domain or out of copyright. This has led to all sorts of descriptive issues around the discoverability of African American materials. As people outside of the area of African American studies or American studies of the 19th century specifically are asked to describe materials that immediately strike them as racist and foreign. Some examples go far in the opposite <coughs> direction, but this music hall lullaby um, is labeled with African American songs and the descriptive text and the subject heading African Americans. This, as the title says, a coon slumber song is laid out in the description and was composed and performed by white women and published by a uh, Jewish man, and is completely a textual novelty. Uh, it is a piece about a goblin who will kidnap you if you do not go to sleep. Beautiful lullaby. Um, and the part that makes the text clear, it's a, even very lightly in minstrel dialect, not heavy as earlier pieces, and what makes it clear that this is about African Americans, other than the fact that it's called the Coon Slumber Song, is that one of the things the goblin will do is make you white as any white child. The rapid processing that leaves this material described principally around its relation to African Americans, aka this white nonsensical performance of blackness, both obfuscates the content, which is the performance of African Americanness. This is not an African American song. No African Americans were involved. They might have performed it in later times, but as an example I often put on this is Calling this type of music African American songs is like calling the Protocols of the Elders of Zion Jewish literature. It's literature about Jews in a way that is harmful. This is music about African Americans in a way that is harmful. But the descriptive terms that always get thrown on these are African Americans, which again to users when we link these materials together tells them that we as libraries and archives are saying that we think this type of material is reflective of what African American history is or should be. So the lack of these processing times and historic background to know, I mean, I happen to have a background in 19th century performance of blackness. That's a benefit to me in seeing these problems. That is not an assumed credential for someone who has to catalog or process tons and tons of materials. But these lack of skills and the concept of descriptive neutrality leads to our aggregations having materials that bring together records that are like because of their relation to descriptive practice rather than like in terms of content. So I could go on with many other examples that show the pitfalls inherent in interesting aggregation and the mass digitization that leads to it and surfacing hidden materials related to marginalized peoples. I think these two examples provide a good enough glimpse into the experience of my work. As I've said throughout, you know, I'm not a linked open data expert and I welcome questioning and problematizing my own takeaways from this experience in the face of deeper knowledge in those specific areas. I think it's just important to not forget sort of the trade-offs that are inherent in linking things together at a large scale while we all also acknowledge what we've been doing at a large scale has not been to the benefit of the subaltern. Thank you.
um, bring to the front uh, for our speakers to respond to questions. And if actually, if um, we grab that microphone for them. Oneself to uh, to engage, and while that microphone um, finds its way around the room, don't hesitate to raise your hand. In the meantime, I'm going to um, I'm going to sort of speak with them, uh, you know, respond, ask a question, be engaged with the with the uh, speakers myself. Um, there were there was a lot of really interesting topics raised throughout all all three of the talks, all four of the talks, I really should say. Um, and what really struck me toward the end, especially, was the idea of community and the idea of the fact that we always speak about having a community, you know, community engagement in, in metadata practices being something that we, we should strive for, but the, the actual idea that for historical materials, of course, the community is no longer with us, and it's an interpretation and a passing down of knowledge through communities, but not actually the community itself um, that's engaging, and I, I'm certain that I just messed that up, but, um, but that, uh, that was my best attempt at articulation. And I was, I was thinking about the Wikidata presentation from earlier and also Philip's presentation about LD4P and bringing together either the, the community that exists now around Wikidata or, or um, just reusing data from other, from other places and not are reinterpreting the reinterpretation that they had already made. So for instance, the German example where uh, we're recataloging things that have already been cataloged by native speakers. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about, or around this a bit more, bring together the, the ideas of engagement um, in those communities, and, um, and really uh, that democratization and the, the affordances that perhaps, that where we have pitfalls around historical materials and historical descriptive practices and how we could perhaps um, have a call to arms around correction. And, and really, really refocus that that by engagement and reuse of, and that magic bullet um, idea that Amanda raised earlier as well. So I'll start with a few comments and then pass it on. I think uh, one of the things uh, that I keep thinking about is that uh, the community needs to change. That's when I listen to everybody speaking. That is what I, what that's what I got out of it. I sort of think for myself back towards that history of when we moved from um, printed cards to mark. All we did was reproduce the printed card on the computer screen. And so often now, as we're thinking about moving to linked data, we're just all we're doing. Uh, it's interesting. I was speaking with somebody once uh, who was working with linked data. They said, "You're not working with linked data. You're working with linked metadata." So metadata is close to link anyway, and all you're doing is putting it in a different format. And until we think about actually approaching that differently, um, how it's created, um, being able to get metadata to a lot more things in a very in a very different way, maybe using AI for different multiple different approaches, all we're doing is recreating something from a long time ago and preserving it going forward. So it really is to me that the community and how we actually generate the metadata. Uh, the terms that we give to it, everything just needs to change. And that is the big opportunity for us now and also the pitfall that we need to be very careful of is not just to perpetuate what we've done in the past uh, in this new way of approaching things. One of the things um, that has been really wonderful about sort of design for diversity is just getting to talk to a bunch of different people and Hear from them what has worked and what hasn't, and, and there are a couple of points of um, impact that we found. So one is mass digitization, where often grants are written to the way that grants are written vastly underestimates the labor to do good metadata period, and then um, vastly underestimates the the chance to do you know what you could call recuperative metadata. So I think one potential sort of big picture thing is to when we look at these hidden collections grants, when we look at these mass digitization projects to say, and you know, tell your dean this, good luck, right? But we're going to do half of what we said we were going to do, but we're going to 
as Dorothy was talking, I was thinking, what is the historical training that cattle mothers get? Right? Like, I don't have any, or I have some from reading or learning on the job because I want to do a good job, but you know, I don't have like, historical training. Um, so writing into, for example, you know, your your processing workflow, thinking about historical training and then recuperative metadata. And that's a point where people said they were able to achieve that goal, is when you're already doing a bunch of digitization. Because going to a library administrator and saying, I want to do work on all of our 10 million records right now, hasn't, I don't believe, worked for anyone yet. So it's either at that point of a big project or at the point of a system change. So uh, as people migrate from one version of Fedora to another, or as people migrate from one library catalog to another, that's where you can say, all right, we're putting tens of millions of dollars tens of millions of dollars into this. Let's put an extra X amount and think about sort of better metadata in the historical context. Um, so none of those are really my, oops, well, that's my idea, but some of that's also just what I've learned from other folks. And that's kind of a question I have. I think the folks here have much more experience than I do with large scale digitization projects. So my question back to you is where do you write that in? Where do you get that into the workflow in a way that actually sort of gets funny? Um, <laughs> speaking on behalf of the wiki crowd, um, I want to connect the dots of some things you said. Um, the, the labor involved with doing a good job is very um, present to me. And as a Wikipedian and data enthusiast um, and a great believer in crowdsourcing, I think um, there's an obvious connection to be made there. But unlike uh, what some people think, crowdsourcing and citizen participation um, does not mean, oh, we don't need you know the librarians anymore, we don't need the subject matter experts anymore. On the contrary, we need them more than ever. Um, but combining the professional knowledge, the historical knowledge, the, the library science knowledge with the sheer raw labor that we can get from crowdsourcing, doing it cleverly, and there's a ton of UI challenges there, there's a ton of platform design challenges there. I've seen a lot of crowdsourcing projects just fail spectacularly. You know, people don't show up, they show up and they get demotivated. So there's an art to doing it right, but combining crowdsourcing with expertise, and, and I want to thank you for the example you gave, it was very uh, illuminating, I think, because uh, crowdsource, I mean, a crowdsourcing volunteer would exactly be likely to, to catalog that song as, you know, African American song, uh, and not think, uh, you know, uh, twice, just, just click that button and move on. That's why we need expert involvement, that's why we need layers of uh, verification, that's why we need um, different trust models, like, you know, do you accept anything that was crowdsourced, or do you only accept it after it was vetted, or do you only accept it after it was vetted twice? You know, we can design these things. I think that's the big challenge facing all of us, is how to design the platforms to enable this great potential with link data and public participation. So. Um, I'm just going to pick up on that. Well, thank you to all the speakers for your um, contributions this morning. Um, so a couple points that I, I'd be curious to well, have anybody respond to is that um, thank you for the example of uh, sheet music. We have at my institution engaged in mass digitization of sheet music. Um, my actual training is as a music cataloger, so I have uh, training both in um, music and in um, metadata, and what we found was that we had students, of course, doing the um, metadata work, and we actually just had to take all of those subject headings off, because they were not, so right now most of them don't have, have very little, because they just did not have the capacity to understand the context of those materials, and uh, so that's been a real struggle, and a real practical struggle, and I think a lot of what we're talking about are practical struggles around resources. So while crowdsourcing can provide some help, it's not a panacea to the problem that we have because I, what I see in Wikidata, for example, is replications of some of the same problems we have in other areas when it comes to marginalized communities, when it comes to diversity, we see the same 
uh, problems and knowledge structures just being replicated in another place. So, and on an international scale, which adds a layer of complexity that is somewhat different than what we see with our own standards. So I guess, you know, it is a question of like, how do we deal with the fact that we actually have somewhat of a resource problem when we actually need resources to address long-standing systemic problems in our data? We do actually kind of need to start over in a lot of ways, but we know that's also impossible. So how do we not just replicate past problems? How do we make sure that we have people who have uh, the skills and knowledge to understand the materials they're dealing with? Because linked data, it's all about linking uh, and leveraging the ability to link to things in a way that actually um, really is impactful and surfaces things in a way that, that we are unable to do in our current system. So how do we think about doing that in a way that helps all of our communities. When we think about it, it's not one community. We have all kinds of different communities that have all, all kinds of different needs and have all different opinions about what's important. So I think it's a really big problem, but it is a somewhat of a, of a um, values and resource issue. Sorry, I, there's a question there. I, I mean, I would just be curious. <laughs> I mean, so, so it's a question of like, do you do nothing? very much that it was a wide array of resources issue. I often, in longer presentations on this topic, I'll often want to throw that in because I do not think, and I think it's very easy for to fall into a, a feeling of even more than an opinion or a decision of, that these sort of choices are made because someone thought about it and then said, this is how this is described in like a longer term. Like they had context and they thought, no, I still think minstrelsy is a really good representation of black people. And that's what I put in there. It's a tough thing. And I think it's very difficult because the people that make those high level funding decisions see numbers of a lot of things got digitized and they do have some sort of metadata because I can look at them. And that's the, you know, I've been on projects before and just kept hearing them. Well, can't I just get more numbers? Like, can we get higher numbers? Can we get more page scans? Saying, well, we don't have more materials related to this. Well, can we not make compound objects then? Can each page be its own object? <laughs> Which I get, honestly, I, I, we all have different concerns. I don't get it human. I get it as a person. Like, if I was in a different role and I was reporting back to someone above me who had even more control over the purse strings and wanted to be able to say in a big presentation, we put two million things online. So it's a very much resource heavy issue. But I also think, and this is obviously becoming more and more of a thought that's going across the field, is just sort of, well, how are we, like, if we know that people higher above us think that and we don't necessarily agree with those sort of things, why are we entering into projects, like Ned was saying, that we know are unachievable? And part of that is because grants, funders often want something unachievable because that looks very good, and we all know that they'll forgive us when we say, we actually didn't make Two million, we made three hundred fifty thousand, but we did them very well. And it's you know you're not gonna they're not gonna take them and back to take away your digital images. So we all know that's kind of part of the game. But sort of I think kind of gaining that up more, and that's you know that's the issue with resources around processing, around research time, around how we treat contingently. I mean that's part of the bigger adjunctification of everything in academia, including libraries and archives and museums. But I mean, I think to me that's the bigger issue rather than just the, I wish these folks knew more about more of like people's history, which I do, but there are other periods of African American history that I'm less versed on that when I've done projects like this, I've had the ability to say, I know what the Moynihan Report is, I want to dig really deep into the Moynihan Report before I describe these materials. I haven't studied the 1970s or 60s, I never did, but you know, it's that sort of thing of like, even then what we do is we hire someone in and we're like, this person is Chicano. They will do all of our Latino materials because now we've got a name. That is another thing. We, amongst certain communities, we discuss this all the time as part of our lives. But that's, you know, it's a really bigger, 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 bigger picture even than just what we have. So, well, one 
quick comment to make as well before we go on, because I know there are other questions here as well. Um, one of the things we haven't really talked about uh, is AI in relationship to LinkedIn. So fully acknowledging Sophie Noble's algorithms of oppression and all the dangers of AI and the perspective that it can impose, I think a lot of the issues we have is one of scale. Um, and I think that it can offer a possible solution, especially with archival material. You can, you can use entity extraction to pull things out of digital text, um, be able to apply, um, maybe work with Wikidata to be able to supply identifiers. You can, you can identify and give access to a lot of different things at a massive scale that you can So images are a lot more difficult to, to uh, deal with in that way. Uh, but you can add different lenses in the AI and how you like to approach materials. So there's a lot of possibilities in working at scale with AI and with data that is never, it won't be possible with humans, but humans can only do so much. Yeah. Um, but I think this, this, it, this is sort of a, a, it sounds like a facile response, but I think it is actually meaningful, is if you make um, inclusion a core value in your institution, um, and your library administration is a part of that, then they make that part of every workflow. I mean, like, that's really easy to say, and it sounds like it's a more fuzzy thing, but I think what it creates is um, a dean who can go back to university administration or funders and say, our, our library's core values are this. And so for that reason, we're only going to do 350,000, but we're going to try to do it in a much more historically informed way. And so that's where, um, in, in the research that we've done at Northeastern, we sort of looked at um, making organizational change kind of an axis. I mean, again, that's sort of a facile answer in some ways, but in other ways, it's the only way you get people to buy in to, to have the fight to give that, um, to make sure that every project has the time and the space to do it, um, to make sure that you're saying, yes, we're not going to do this unless it has X, Y, Z. Hi. Uh, uh, my name is Basil. I'm from Nigeria. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. Uh, thank you to Stanford Library for the uh, travel grant. Uh, my question is on uh, with data, with data in the library. Uh, in my in country, which, which I come from, Nigeria, the awareness of big data and big data is very low among the public libraries and among their librarians. And these are the library closer to the communities in terms of satisfying that information. As I, I work in an academic library, I work with Redeemers University. As an academic librarian, I've tried. What, my question is, what can I do to create more awareness about big data, link data in library? Because if you look at it, because the, the reasons are, some of them, they have some limitation because of the skill level of some of these librarians, maybe funding from the government. So what can we do to create more awareness? Thank you. One, one thing you can definitely do is talk to Asaf here, since uh, that's his, I don't want to say job, but that's his, uh, I guess that's his job, is to evangelize what you did, especially to places outside of North America. So definitely talk to Asaf right there. Um, we actually had a recent Land Wiki conference where we had some folks in Nigeria there, and they had the same goals that you had as well. And we did some exploratory queries with Kidata to see what the coverage of biographies about Nigerians were. So the nice, Coincidence there. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, in some dimensions, it was, it was interesting. There was a lot that came back. Unfortunately, most of the biographies were about like second generation Nigerians born outside of Nigeria but had Nigerian citizenship. So if you said, show me all Nigerian athletes in Wikidata, most of them were born in like Minnesota and other places but happened to have their data in a Olympic database or a sports person's database as country, you know, Nigeria citizenship. So we still need a lot more work to get information from Africa into Wikidata. The graph I showed up there, or the map I showed, shows better coverage, but spotty. We need a much better concerted effort to get that in there. And we're behind that. We'd love to do that. Um, I'm also wondering, and so this is a question for anyone, but what are the um, Wikidata
data applications that are going to be incredibly compelling for your public libraries. So if Wikidata powers a catalog, or if Wikidata develops some sort of interface that is just so much easier and better, um, that's where I feel like maybe the Wikidata community plus sort of wealthy libraries can, can maybe come together and start to create these applications that then make it just so easy and it's so compelling for public librarians where I imagine everywhere public librarians do amazing work with, <laughs> without a lot of support. So, you know, if, if, again, like there's an amazing catalog that the Wikidata helps build and everyone wants to get on it because it's the best option. So, although there are actually quite a number of hands that were going up, um, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, I will encourage everybody, though, to engage with the speakers throughout the next two days, to engage, of course, with each other around the topics that you want to raise. Um, we are heading into a break, and for respect of everyone's time, we will go into the break now rather than stealing from there. Um, after the break, there are three sessions, the second and third columns in your agenda. Those are breakouts that are one level below us on the second floor. Um, the rotunda is this room, so the first column will continue to be in here. Um, with that, please join me in thanking our speakers.